Welcome to the second module of the um, Lyle Business System Yellow Belt course. Um, this one's called Introduction to Lean Manufacturing. And this is uh, typically the presentation that we would give at the beginning of a formal five-day rapid improvement event. Okay, so where do we start? The first question is, why are we here? Um, what are we hoping to accomplish with our lean program? Well, it's all about performance and um, in today's world there are no job guarantees. Um, contrary to how things run in Japan, there really haven't been any job guarantees in the United States manufacturing for quite a while. Um, so what is the next best thing? The next best thing is to work for a healthy company. Now, Lean is all about performance, and the idea is that if you improve quality, uh, you reduce costs, you improve your delivery to your customer, uh, that leads to customer satisfaction, which leads to increased sales and profits, which leads to the long-term health of your company. Uh, that's the best we could do these days to ensure that um, all of associates at all level of the company can enjoy um, security, advancement, and uh, economic benefits. Okay, so what's Lean? Lean is a set of principles, concepts, and techniques designed for a relentless pursuit of elimination of waste, producing efficiently just a just-in-time system that will deliver to our customers exactly what they need, when they need it, in the quantity they need, in the right sequence, without defects, and at the lowest possible cost. Okay, um, you know, this in contrast, you know, the older method of manufacturing, uh, which was financially driven, uh, we would try to optimize our setup times, optimize our machine utilization, uh, all sorts of metrics to optimize our financials that customers could care less about. Um, exactly what they need as opposed to what we're what's easy for us to build when they need it as opposed to building it too soon or building it too late in the quantity they need as opposed to overrunning to optim you know to get the best usage of our equipment or to amortize setup times or anything of, of that sort uh, in the right sequence as opposed to batching as opposed to uh, cherry picking uh, without defects, self-explanatory, and at the lowest possible cost. Okay, so where do we get our terminology of lean, our concepts of lean? Well, you know, there were older versions, you know, used to be called just-in-time. I, I learned a version called demand flow technology when I was first out of college. But in 1996, a book was published called Lean Thinking by Womack and Jones, and it codified the five principles of lean thinking. Uh, so the logical progression of, of lean thinking is, first of all, define what the value is. And value only makes sense when you define it from the point of view of the customer. Uh, what's the customer willing to pay for? Uh, the way I describe it um, when there's any question about it is, could you put that step on an invoice and would the customer accept it on an invoice? Well, you know, if they ask for a hole to be drilled and they give you a drawing with a hole in it and you itemize the hole being drilled on a, an invoice, well, they may think it's too detailed, but they would accept it. Um, if you put that you counted the product five times, you tested it three times, um, you lost it, you looked for it, you moved it around the factory. Well, you put all those steps on, a, on an invoice and they're going to laugh at you and reject it. Okay, so that's the difference between value and, and non-value. Um, once you understand what the value is that the customer is willing to pay for, then you organize the steps of your process into a value stream, uh, which means that you lay everything out in a logical sequence from beginning to end to produce the product or service that the customer is paying you for. Once you have these steps laid out in front of you, um, you figure out how to make the value stream flow. So you organize the value stream so that the product or service or the person moving through the value stream in the case of healthcare or that kind of thing is continuously moving and there's no delays. 
once you establish that, then you control the flow uh, with pull, with pull system, uh, with pull signals. Uh, so that means you're only building or you're only producing at each step what you need uh, based on the person or the process downstream of you. And then, of course, once you have all those things in place, uh, you have the concept of perfection or Kaizen, uh, which is continuous improvement. And it's always called continuous improvement forever uh, because we never want to become complacent and assume that we've come up with the one best way of doing things. There's always a better way. So value, again, value is a tangible product or service that your customer is willing to pay for. Adding value is the primary goal of a business. Anything else is waste. Okay, so that's the strict definition of value and the strict definition of waste in lean terminology, which is different than um, just everyday language and everyday definition of waste. Uh, to define value, you have to understand who your customer is and what they want or need. So the trick is a customer can either be the end user or it could be the person downstream of you. Okay, so some examples of uh, value added uh, changes the value of an item. So some things, you know, some really tan tangible things could be drilling, assembling, painting, cutting, welding. Those are some examples of value added activities. Non-value added activities consume time and money but do not change the value of an item. So some examples of these are sorting, counting, stacking, expediting, and checking. Okay, so one interesting point, a couple of different gray areas. Uh, one gray area could be testing. Uh, testing could be non-value added if you're doing the test to make up for the fact that you have an incapable process. Or it could be value added if the customer has actually specified it. And again, you go back to the test, you know, can you itemize this on an invoice and the customer would be willing to pay for it. Well, if they asked you for it in the specification, if they told you you had to test something for 15 seconds, you're testing it for 15 seconds, it becomes part of your, your uh, standard cost. And uh, yeah, it is by definition a value adding task from your perspective. What's a process? A process is a complete set of sequential steps that produce a product or deliver a service. Uh, process flow analysis is a very old technique. It's uh, from the earlier days of industrial engineering and it's a charting mechanism to illustrate a process. Uh, a value stream map is typically a process flow analysis that also includes a data box and it has information on uh, uh, different sorts of times, uh, tack time, the cycle time, uh, may have a crew size, uh, may have information on quality like first pass yield, uh, any number of things uh, that affect the uh, time and affect the uh, cost of the activity. Okay, uh, what is a rapid improvement event? A rapid improvement or a Kaizen event is an intense focused activity and the full full-blown Kaizen events are typically four and a half days. Uh, it involves a team focused on a specific area to make a breakthrough improvement, uh, typically involving changing something from batch to a cell or improving an existing cell uh, to dramatically increase uh, productivity, um, improve safety, improve visual management, any number of things. But it has to be a breakthrough and a substantial uh, improvement in a small amount of time. Uh, so the specific lean tools used to identify waste, um, we'll talk about a little, a little bit more later, has its roots in the Toyota production system, and it's applied wherever work is done. So it's not just factory specific. Uh, we've done a lot of events that are in administrative areas as well. Uh, lean is a learn by doing process. Uh, learn the tools by using them. And the other thing that uh, differentiates between a Kaizen event or just tinkering around or, you know, something, you know, project oriented is you have to have a, a measurable improvement in that time frame. So there's specific metrics. Don't pick too many, but just two or three different metrics. 
um, and you improve from a current state to a future state value. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the problem with traditional improvements. Well, uh, my background's in industrial engineering, and industrial engineering has a, a more than 100 year history now, 120 years. And through most of the time, uh, we focused on the value added portion of what's done in a factory. I mean, we, we have had our mapping exercises, and sometimes we look at the bigger picture, but let's face it, most of the time we're doing time studies on end, end item assembly lines. And it turns out that when you look at the big picture, um, this is a, a map of where you start from beginning to end in a process. And, uh, it, you know, say a piece comes in at the left-hand side of this bar. Uh, it comes in one door, goes out the other side of the factory, out the other door. It turns out in various studies that 95% of the time that it's flowing through this building, uh, it's, there's non-value added activities being done to it, or no values being added to the product or service. And only 5% of that time or less, there's actual value being added. So what happens when you look at just improving the value added part without actually looking at the lead time to the factory? Well, it turns out, you know, if you're making faster machines or even certain types of line balancing, unless you take care of that hidden factory, that waste that goes on as the product or service is flowing through the system, you just end up with a higher percentage of non-value added and you really don't improve anything from the point of view of the customer. So lean involves uh, looking at this 95% non-value added um, even before you deal with that 5% value added. Okay, uh, rapid improvement is about seeing waste and we talked about there being a strict definition of the, of the word waste when you're talking about lean that's different than you'd use it in common language. Uh, waste is not a judgment. If something is non-value added, which is also a strict definition, it's waste. Uh, what we want to do is not personalize things. We want to implement solutions that eliminate the waste. This creates performance. This improves, perf and the improved performance improves uh, job security. So when you look at things, it's not the fault of the person uh, doing the job that they're doing something non-value added because, you know, going back to Deming, the concept is management designs the system and the workers find themselves as part of the system. Um, it's not their fault that they're doing it because they were told to do it. The work was designed that way. But when the time comes to tighten the belt, when uh, demand goes down, when the economy takes a, takes a, a dive, uh, those will be the first people who pay for it. So uh, although people become uncomfortable understanding that their job is, is being called wasteful or it's being called non-value added, uh, you really don't want to personalize it because it's in your own best interest to find yourself doing something value added when times get hard. Um, so these are some of the ground rules we use in our events and in our analyses. If it's non-value added, we call it waste. Steps are wasteful. So it's, it's always process oriented. It's always depersonalized kind of a process engineering point of view. The steps in the process can be wasteful. People are valuable. And the reason is because, you know, people are problem solvers. People are creative. So, you know, we're never talking about people are wasteful. It's just the activities they've been given to do may be wasteful. And don't take it personally. Let's improve it. So this thing about don't take it personally, we, what we really want to do in the ideal state of our lean training is to make sure that the operators can become their own process engineers. They can actually see what they're doing objectively from the outside and not internalize and you know, start to become personally identified with um, you know, some of the things that they're doing, especially if it's non-value added. Uh, people are creative, and creative means that they can adapt to change, they can solve problems, and you know, their resources. Okay, uh, these are the eight categories of non-value added activities, or the eight ways. Uh, transportation, which is moving people and stuff. Inventory, uh, by contrast, is stuff that's waiting to be worked. Uh, motion, unnecessary human movement. Waiting time, people waiting for stuff to arrive. 
um, overproduction, which means stuff too much or too early. And of course, stuff, you know, we're generalizing. You know, we don't know what you make. We don't know what uh, product or service you're providing. So we're general, generalizing this. Um, overprocessing, stuff we have to do that doesn't add value to the stuff we are supposed to be producing. Defects, stuff that's not right and needs fixing. And intelligence wasted. Okay, so one common question, what's the difference between overprocessing and defects? Uh, it's both things that the customer didn't ask for. The difference is that overprocessing, um, as long as we're incurring the, the cost of it, the customer is still willing to accept it. Uh, defects are, are things that the customer didn't ask for that they're not willing to accept. So that's the difference between the two things. Of course, defects is worse, but overprocessing can create delays to the customers and it incurs costs for the company. Uh, very bad things. Um, intelligence wasted, you know, we talked about that briefly earlier that uh, people are best used for creativity, problem solving. Um, we don't want them doing things that are not to their skill level. We want to challenge people, you know, we want to keep people engaged and, you know, that's why that was added to the original seven ways. Okay, so here's a quick video on the seven ways found in manufacturing. We'll run that really quickly. We'll see how this works. It's an experiment of video inside a video. The seven ways found in manufacturing is an enlightening video that defines and gives examples of each waste with their associated consequences. Waste elimination is key to any lean organization. Enjoy. Waste is the opposite of value, and you should continue adding value while reducing or eliminating the waste in your business processes. There are typically seven types of waste found in manufacturing, and for the purposes of this presentation, I will assign an animation to represent each waste that will be used throughout. Excess inventories means holding or purchasing unnecessary raw materials, excess work in process, or finished goods. Unneeded processing time or overprocessing means having unnecessary steps, work elements, or procedures. Waiting means time delays, idle time, or time during which value is not added to the product, adding costs without creating value. Waiting lengthens the total cycle time unnecessarily. Excessive motion is the actions of people or equipment that do not add value to the product. Overproduction can be early production, producing over the customer requirements, or producing unnecessary materials or products. Defective products means producing a part that is scrapped or requires rework or consuming resources without making a product for the customer. The waste of transportation means multiple handling or unnecessary handling and ultimately causes the delay of material delivery to the next operation. These wastes do not add value to the product and must be identified and either eliminated or reduced. Your business will not reach its full potential when these wastes exist. Examples of excess inventories include most of the work in process between operations, also called batch and queue, is excess inventory. And producing more than the customer demands causes excess inventories. The consequences of having excess inventories include the waste of waiting. Watch this one batch of parts as it slowly makes its way through production. As you can see, all of the work in process between operations causes the lead time of each batch to increase drastically. Most of the time spent in manufacturing is waiting. All of that waiting causes longer lead times and delays. Excess inventory prevents problems from being detected quickly enough. In this example, let's pretend you're processing a thousand piece batch. 
the red ball represents your batch of material as okay, it so way through the Okay, so the last uh, topic is manufacturing the third cells. Finds a and with the manufacturing first cells are a key tool in eliminating all eight forms of waste in a production process utilizing the uh, Cells can be seen when as a physical implementation website, of a process flow diagram with all the storage steps and delays removed. Okay, so uh, here's an example of uh, the difference between traditional flow versus cellular flow. Um, in traditional flow, you have uh, uh, specialized departments. So you may have a screw machine department, a uh, mill department, a lathe department, um, then powder coating, and then finally a subassembly department and assembly department. Um, at every stage, you have incoming queues and you have outcoming, outgoing queues. Um, in the old days, you'd even have a central warehouse in the middle, and the parts would go in and out of each, out of the warehouse um, every time you went up a level in the bill of materials. Um, everything every, and every level was scheduled separately by MRP during a week. So every level of the bill of materials, you'd have like a minimum one week lead time. So that's an extreme case. That's the way things were done, you know, up until the 70s, 80s. Um, then we began to do things in manufacturing cells. So in a manufacturing cell. You take each um, each of the operations in a process step and you physically lay it out on the floor to do small increments of whatever it is that you're uh, that you're building or whatever service it is you're providing. Put them right next to each other uh, in small quantities. Uh, balance the uh, the activities at each step, and you just have a single income incoming of raw material. Uh, every step is done within the line of sight, and you have a finished product at the end it's rather than a sub-assembly or work in process. Um, so what you do in order to define what's run in your cell is you, um, you establish uh, groups of parts with common processing sequences and uh, commonality in, in equipment. Uh, the interesting thing is that in some cases the work sequence may be different from the uh, part flow sequence. So uh, where you have the parts uh, uh, going counterclockwise, you may have the workers going from operation to operation and just working whatever's in front of them going, uh, going clockwise or vice versa. Uh, so the work sequence could be separate. Um, in a lot of companies, you know, if you don't have um, a Hoshin process or any number of other high-level things, you probably organize your lean program through a value stream mapping exercise. So you map your whole value stream from beginning to end. You record all the metrics. You can see the small little um, Kaizen burst symbols or identifications of opportunities for improvement. And then um, this allows you to look at your system as a whole, figure out exactly where the constraints are, where the bottlenecks are, where you get the best impact for scheduling rapid improvement events. So you schedule your rapid improvement events wherever you're having a significant quality issue or wherever you have a significant bottleneck, and then you can be sure that your pro the improvements you make will go directly to the bottom line of the company. Okay, a couple um, aspects of uh, single piece flow in cells. Uh, define common groupings of parts, uh, single piece flow inside the cell. Uh, you want to set your, you want to right size your equipment as best as you can and have everything very tightly compact so that you can have as few as one operator is running a cell. So you want to be able to scale down to that. Um, <clears throat> you don't want to have what they call bird cages or barriers. Okay, so. For the longest time, I had no idea what they were talking about with bird cages, but you see in, mo in a lot of cases, you know, the preferred orientation of lean is a, is a U shape. A bird cage closes the U shape, so you don't want to have a closed circle uh, for safety considerations and also for part flow considerations. Um, you also don't want to have barriers. So when you're talking about barriers, obviously it could be something in between the equipment. It could be orienting the equipment so somebody's working on the outside of the U. Uh, you don't want to have anything that prevents operators from flexing effectively between the stations, helping each other out, um, anything of that sort. So you don't want those things. Um, Counterclockwise is the um, preferred direction, not mandatory. Most of the places I've worked at, 
Uh, it's been either way. Uh, now the reason for that, and it's funny because a lot of the lean practitioners you'll you'll talk to, you know, they'll just say, well, just because, you know, because the sensei said to do it that way. Well, that's not a good way to explain things to people. Um, the reason is, and this goes back to industrial engineering, motion economy, uh, human factors, that kind of thing. Um, when you um, when you uh, gain control of a part. As it's, as it's coming into your station, that requires more control and more dexterity, and most people are right-handed. So you're going to gain control of the part and orient it with your right hand, but when you're done with what you're doing, typically you slide the part away to the, uh, to the downstream operation, and that doesn't require control, it doesn't require dexterity, so that's more easily done with your left hand. So that's one reason. Um, the second reason is for uh, whatever the cause is, you know, whatever the cognitive thing is. Uh, over a hundred years ago, when they restarted the uh, the modern Olympics in uh, in Greece, they did experiments of people running track, and uh, most people again being right-handed, running counterclockwise. There's a fraction, a small fraction of uh, of a few seconds uh, benefit to running counterclockwise versus clockwise. And in general, you know, another thing you, another place you see this out in the world is you go to amusement parks and the, uh, the clockwise, most of the, the scary rides that are meant to disorient you are actually, what direction are they? Clockwise. Uh, the only exception being the, uh, carousels that the small children go on, which are typically counterclockwise and they're, it's made to be a comforting sort of motion. Okay. So there actually is a reason why they say, to um, put your cells counterclockwise if possible. Um, obviously, uh, you could see in the configuration here, you want people to flex between operations. So whatever station you're flexing to, you have to be certified to operate it. So you need multi-skilled people. So uh, some sort of skills matrix is always something that's very useful when you're setting up uh, a lean system. And then of course, a layout based on the flow steps. Okay, this is an example of a, uh, of a work cell, uh, not in our facility. Um, but you can see how everything's tightly uh, compact together. You have a single operator that's able to go from station to station to station and load and unload the equipment. Um, everything done in one small area of space and the finished part comes out the end of it. Okay, and this is probably one of the most advanced forms of uh, lean cell. It's uh, called a chaku uh, uh, chaku line, uh, which is made up of uh, machines with Hanadashi devices. Chaku uh, chaku means uh, continuous loading, load load cell, which means that you load, you move on, but you don't have to unload. So this is an idea of the separation of uh, uh, person and machine. So that the, pers the machine does what the machine can do best, the person does what the person can do best. And we'll play that right now. Okay, so you can see the operator just seamlessly goes from one machine to the next. There's no delays. And all that she's doing is loading. Uh, she's loading, she's in inspecting, checking. So you see that's something, you know, just that uh, simple visual, you know, the simple human judgment that, that, that you use, uh, that machines are, you know, we struggle to have machines do the same kind of thing. Uh, so she's constantly loading, uh, doing a few little adjustments, but for the most part, she's constantly moving and the equipment is doing the vast majority of the labor. Okay, so this is kind of a preview of some of the other uh, tools and modules we'll be talking about later. Uh, to establish a cell, you need single piece flow, you need standard work, you need 6S, and you need to establish pull systems. So those are all going to be topics we talk about uh, later in the course. Okay, so um, this is the, uh, the House of Lean as you've probably heard it before. 
Um, the two foundations of the House of Lean are just in time, which obviously is a much older concept than even the, the term lean. And it means uh, synchronizing everything, uh, just making the right parts when it's needed, what's needed, when needed, and the quantity needed. Uh, the other pillar is the concept of automation. So the video we just saw right now was an exa example of automation. Um, by having the, uh, the Honda Dashi device, the automatic ejection, it allows the worker to um, constantly move and not have to stand there doing a non-value-added operation of the equipment. Um, so it's autonomous, um, defect-free. Uh, if there's a defect anywhere in the, in this, in the um, system, the whole thing will stop and the operator will come in and you know, use your problem solving skills or ask for help or escalate. Um, and of course, you know, in that kind of system, you have to have automatic detection of abnormal conditions. So these are the two pillars of the Toyota production system. And of course, um, we all know that, uh, well, uh, we know after learning that the foundation is leveling of overall volume and, and uh, product mix. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we uh, get further into the course. Okay, so again, just a preview of some of the advanced um, the advanced level of tools that we're going to learn about later. Uh, we're going to be talking about tack time, which is the rate of customer demand. Uh, we're going to be talking about production control boards and visual management. We're going to be talking about uh, key points diagrams, pull systems, uh, time observations, uh, spaghetti or flow diagrams, uh, capacity sheets, uh, total productive maintenance, uh, setup reduction. Uh, we're going to be talking about bar charts or also called work allocation diagrams. Uh, we're going to be talking about standard worksheets and also standard work combination sheets. Uh, pokey yoke or mistake proofing, uh, leveling techniques, uh, 6S in visual management, standard work in process. And of course we just went over an example of uh, load load, uh, which you know, the machine automatically ejects and the operator moves continuously and uh, single piece flow. Okay, so thank you very much and we'll see you in the next course module. The next course module will be on uh, success in visual management.